I guess uh, multiplied millions of people are meeting in various church buildings today as we are meeting here. <coughs> Most of those meeting and uh, engaging in their worship activities and uh, listening to the sermons uh, likely have uh, one criterion in mind though they may not uh, be cognizant of it. That their practices and the doctrines they're taught do not involve any immorality. In other words, they are morally innocent. And as far as I know, they would be uh, accurate in that assessment. Although the time uh, may come when there are religious bodies that... uh, engage in immoral acts. There were in ancient pagan religions and I suppose still modern pagan religions. And as more churches that um, <clears throat> try to identify with Christianity become less and less bound to the book, they will become more paganistic and may involve eventually in uh, immoral practices. But there's another element involved when we come to matters of religion besides mere morality. When we are expressing our devotion to God in worship, or when we are striving to live in a way day by day to serve Him, the scriptures come into play. What God has revealed to us about what pleases Him become the overbearing criterion. It goes without saying, but we'll say it, that if God has decreed it, it is moral. So we do not have to worry about its passing the moral test if God has authorized it. But there are many things that are morally innocent, but they are scripturally guilty. That is, when placed before the standard of God's word, they fail the test. They fall We can see this from uh, man's earliest approaches to God. Genesis chapter 3, when Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, she did nothing immoral, but God had decreed that that fruit was forbidden. And so it was an act that did not pass God's word, that test. In Genesis chapter 4, when Cain offered his bloodless sacrifice, that was not immoral, but it was guilty before what God's word had authorized for the offering. When Nadab and Abihu brought their strange fire before the Lord, as Leviticus 10 tells us, there's no hint of immorality in what they did. But their act made them guilty before the scriptures. Morally innocent, but scripturally guilty. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we read of King Saul's coming back from what should have been the total slaughter of the Amalekites, but he brought back the king and flocks and herds. No immorality is hinted. But God had decreed something else, hadn't he? And so it did not pass the scriptural test. Well, those could be multiplied through God's uh, history of dealings with mankind and man's reaction to what God has decreed and authorized. And they spill over into the New Testament as well. And they bring us right down to our own times where men are still evaluating their Approach to God merely on the basis of is it moral or immoral and not on the basis of whether it is scripturally authorized or unauthorized. And so by the hundreds, doctrines and practices in our world today, in the name of the religion of Christ, are morally acceptable or innocent, but they are scripturally guilty. So let's explore some of the illustrations of that in our uh, religious world today among professed believers. 
When you turn in your uh, English dictionary to the word baptism, it will say something like this. Sprinkling or immersion in order to gain admission to the Christian church. That's what one of my dictionaries says, but I think it's representative of, of most English dictionaries on the subject of baptism. Well, of course, an English dictionary just reflects the uh, common usage of the term and the uh, current usage of terms. There's certainly nothing immoral about sprinkling water on a person. Uh, many of us do that more than one time a week, I guess, when we take a bath. And um, you cannot fault taking a bath <coughs> on the grounds of morality. But when you come over into the realm of religion, what place does sprinkling have? Well, it's certainly not identified with baptism in the New Testament. In fact, the only kind of sprinkling of which we read in the New Testament is in reference to an Old Testament practice of the sprinkling of blood that was required on the altar of God and some of their animal sacrifices. But when we look at what the New Testament teaches on baptism, sprinkling, though it's morally innocent as an act of religion, it is guilty before the scriptures. There are three grounds of approach to show that that's so, without a doubt. First of all are biblical descriptions of baptism. Acts chapter 8 and verse 38 tells us of a man who had just been hearing the gospel preached by Philip. And the man said, see here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? That's verse 36. And then verse 38 says, after they'd stopped the chariot, they both, Philip and the Ethiopian, went down into the water and he baptized him. They both came up out of the water. Now the significant thing is not in, that in both of them went under the water, but that both of them got down into the water. There have even been some who said uh, all that Luke is describing here is that the Ethiopian points to his uh, jug of water he had on his chariot and said, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? And then uh, Philip sprinkled him. Of course, the rejoinder of that was it surely was a big jug because both of them went down into the water. Oh, there was sufficient water there to do much more than sprinkling, and they could both have stayed on the bank of the water and done the sprinkling, but they both were required to go down into the water for that baptism. Now, what did he do while Philip had the Ethiopian in the water? Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 answers that question. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And as if it were not enough, Paul answered it a second time in Colossians 2 and verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, wherein also you were raised with him, through faith in the working of God who raised him, that is Christ, from the dead. So the first ground of evidence scripturally on what baptism is and is not as far as its action is concerned is the New Testament descriptions of baptism. Twice it's a burial and the third occasion mentioned that required both the subject and the baptizer to go down into a body of water. But a second line of evidence is, and it flows from Romans 6, 4, we just noticed, that sprinkling would absolutely destroy the scriptural analogy that Paul establishes in this passage. He compares one's becoming a Christian to the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. He does not mention the death in Romans 6, 4, 
It's implied because you don't bury a live body. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead, you don't sprinkle dirt on a corpse to bury it. You completely submerge it in the earth or shut it off in a tomb from the surrounding area. And so to allow sprinkling to stand for the act of baptism destroys that scriptural analogy altogether. And then, of course, the third scriptural evidence is the meaning of the word baptism. Our English word is a Greek word spelled in English letters. And if it were translated, it would be immerse and immersion every time because that is the meaning of the Greek term behind our English word, baptism. So, though it's morally innocent to sprinkle water as a religious act and call it baptism, it is totally guilty to do so in light of the scriptures. Then there's the matter of uh, infant so-called baptism. Nothing immoral about uh, baptizing an infant, even if you immersed it, as long as you didn't hold it under very long. But the infant immersion or infant baptisms are generally sprinkling of water on the baby's forehead, or maybe dipping it and wiping the water across the baby's forehead. You've seen it in the movies if you haven't seen it in an actual uh, church service. Well, of course. Uh, the matter of uh, doing anything to a baby or for a baby as a religious act is not immoral in any way, but does it pass the muster of Scripture? What is required of one who is to be baptized? Well, Mark 16, 16 says, He that believeth, that is, believeth the gospel in that context, and is baptized shall be saved. Where is the infant that is capable of believing the gospel? To the believers on Pentecost, Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent ye and be baptized. Where is the infant that, uh, number one, has sins of which to repent, and number two, has the capability of repenting if it had sins? No, I think the scriptures teach that an infant is completely unqualified as a subject of baptism. And so, morally innocent for that practice, and it's going on as I speak right now in probably many, many church buildings, but scripturally guilty. No authorization for it whatsoever. In fact, it is contrary to the scriptures. What's the design of baptism? Well, men have come up with various uh, ideas concerning this. Prominent one is that baptism is the means by which one has his name placed on a church roll. That's the way he gains admission to a church. And that was reflected in the English dictionary definition with which we began a few moments ago. Baptism is sprinkling or immersion by which one gains admission to the Christian church. And so, after one allegedly is saved or forgiven of his sins, the doctrine goes, if you want to be a member of church X, Y, or Z, you must be baptized. So that's one uh, design suggested for baptism. Another design that is suggested for baptism, and this relates to the previous point we just discussed, is that it's to remit inherited sins. That's why the practice of infant baptism, so-called, arose. From the Calvinistic doctrine that every baby that's born is a child of the devil. It is stained with sin that goes all the way back to the, quote, original sin of Eve and Adam. And so this baby, to be saved, has to be baptized. 
So the sprinkling of a baby, which is not baptism, to remove sins that it does not have takes place. This is a good example of how one religious error leads to another religious error. The doctrine of original sin or inherited sin led to the practice of infant baptism or the necessity of it. Well, there is a third idea based upon a total misapprehension of Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. And this one is prominently and almost exclusively promoted by the Mormon church, and that is proxy baptism. Where person A can be baptized for persons B, C, D, E, F, G, or however many more, and person A's baptism will count for all of these. Though they've already died, it will reverse whatever their spiritual condition was at the time of their death. Well, <clears throat> what does the New Testament say about the design of baptism? All of these are morally innocent that we've just mentioned. They don't promote any immorality. They don't involve any immorality. But how do they relate to the scriptures? New Testament is very clear on this. Mark 16, 16, already noticed, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism obviously is a precedent to salvation. It comes before, and thus salvation is dependent in some way upon it. In Acts 2, 38, we see something similar in principle, though the wording is a little different, to believers Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for, meaning in order to receive the remission of sins. Remission of sins comes after, not before, baptism. Baptism has something to do with and precedes, therefore, forgiveness or salvation. In Acts 22.16, Saul of Tarsus was told to be baptized and wash away his sins. Ah, baptism has something to do with the removal of sins, then the cleansing of the sinner of his sins or the guilt of those sins. Not that the water of baptism accomplishes that. We're not told in that passage what washes away sins, but when sins are washed away. We have to look elsewhere in Scripture to learn what washes away sins. And the Scriptures tell us, Revelation 1, verse 5, He washed us from our sins in His own blood, speaking of Christ and His crucifixion. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hebrews 9, verse 22, and specifically meaning the blood of Christ, because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, Hebrews 10, verse 4. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For ye were redeemed, not with corruptible things, with silver or gold, from the vain manner of life handed down from your fathers, but with precious blood, without blemish and without spot, even the blood of Christ. So the Lord takes the blood of Christ in the act of baptism and washes away our sins. But nowhere outside the act of baptism does the New Testament ever place that action on the part of God for the sinner. And so Peter sums it up in 1 Peter 3, and verse 21, Baptism doth also now save us. Not at all meaning that all you need to do is to be immersed in water, to be saved. But simply summing up the fact that this is the final act in the process of one's being saved. And it's not faith. It's not repentance. It's baptism. And so all of these uh, ideas suggested by men and practiced by men and preached by men as the purpose of baptism, 
though they have no moral objection, certainly they fail the scriptural test. They stand guilty before what the New Testament teaches. Baptism is a condition of salvation if the blood of Christ is the cleansing agent of salvation. No baptism, no blood is what the Bible teaches. The millions who are meeting today in most of their assemblies and their church buildings have sung to the tune of an organ, some to an orchestra, some to a rock band. And most of those in these various uh, religious houses of worship have uh, either listened to or sung with a choir. Not anything immoral about that. And the words of the songs that are sung uh, may well have been scriptural words. But do those practices pass the scriptural test? Are they innocent or guilty before the scriptures? Well, let's see. If the Lord had said or if he had... Uh, been silent about the kind of music that we are to have in worship, then we would have some choices. If he had just said, make music, we would have some choices. But he was specific. In Ephesians 5 and verse 19, Paul said that we are to sing and make melody in our hearts. We are to teach and admonish one another. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. As we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so, in those two passages, we're told that singing is what pleases the Lord. There's nothing in either one of them that hints of anything besides singing. Now, there's nothing immoral about playing an instrument. I blew a baritone horn for about 10 years of my childhood and on into college. And since those years, I've uh, played a wash tub on many, many occasions and in many, many places. I don't think there was any immorality involved in that at all or anybody. Now, some might have thought it was outrageous, but I don't think anybody accused me of being immoral as I did it. Nothing immoral about playing an organ. Nothing immoral about having a choir. But does the New Testament authorize it? it? Is the only matter that matters when it comes to our worship of God Almighty. And there's not a soul on the face of the earth who knows anything about what pleases God in worship, but that he's read it right here in the New Testament. That's the only source of information that we have. And anything outside of that is man's guesswork. And he's on very thin ice and dangerous ground. So when these two passages, Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3 and verse 16, are combined, we learn that, that we are all to participate in this singing. We are to sing to one another. And we are to teach and admonish one another in our worship to God in song. And when a choir is standing before us and doing that, and we're sitting silent and listening, we're not obeying what the New Testament says. And when we add an organ or a piano or an orchestra or whatever other kinds of instruments to our singing, we're going beyond what the New Testament authorizes us to do. And so... Instrumental music in worship is even styled by a certain word. Or the non-use of instruments is that dates all the way back to the original practice of simply singing in worship. And that word is a cappella. 
It's a Latin word, but it means in the chapel or church style. Now, where do you suppose that idea came from, that it was in the church style not to use instruments, to have only the voices? Church history clearly documents that instruments were not added unto the worship even of the apostate Roman church until many centuries after the first century. And one would be surprised, I suppose, to learn that as recent as two centuries ago, Protestant denominations would have nothing to do with instruments of music in their worship. Spoke out boldly against it and would not allow it in their assemblies. The solid ground is the scriptural ground, of course. It's not been immoral to introduce those things, but it has been blatantly unscriptural. Before the scriptures, those who use instruments stand guilty. I think it no mere accident, I know it's no mere accident, that immediately after Colossians 3.16, about the kind of music God wants, Paul then says, and whatsoever you do, not just in the kind of music you have in your assemblies, but whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Song we sang just a few minutes ago, do all in the name of the Lord, based right on that passage. And then it closes by saying, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So all that we do, but that certainly embraces what I just said in the context, Paul is saying, sing and make melody in your hearts. Sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Teach and admonish one another in your psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The Lord's Supper has been corrupted terribly through the centuries. It's been turned into the Roman Catholic Mass. It's been given the name sacrament that nowhere appears in the New Testament. It's been called the Eucharist, which is another term that is not used in reference to the New Testament or the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. The terms we have for it in the New Testament are Lord's Supper, Lord's Table, Communion, and Breaking of Bread. Now there will be uh, many people today in their houses of worship observing some version of the Lord's Supper. There will be many others who will not because they uh, observe it perhaps only once a month or maybe once a quarter. There are others who observed it yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. They do it every day of the week as in the Roman Catholic Mass. I don't know of anything immoral in any of those practices relating to and having their root in the Supper of the Lord. But do they pass the scriptural test? There will be uh, various elements that are used in various versions of the Lord's Supper, whether observed today or some other day of the week. There are some who will use uh, bread just as you buy it off of the supermarket shelf. And uh, they will use alcoholic wine. There are others who will say, uh, and who will use just water instead of uh, fruit of the vine in any form. There are others who say that if you're on the mission field and you can't get grape juice, well, grape Kool-Aid will suffice. Well, nothing immoral in any of those of which I'm aware, but uh, they all stand guilty before the Scriptures. When the Lord instituted the Supper, the first record of which we have, Matthew chapter 26, <clears throat> it's in the setting of the Hebrew Passover feast that they had just observed. It would be 
the last Passover before the law was taken out of the way and the Passover became Passover. And in the setting of that Passover, there could only be unleavened bread. And it was that bread that Jesus took and gave thanks for and told the apostles to eat of it, representative of his body. They had fruit of the vine as part of the Passover feast. It's significant that uh, the word wine is not used here in Matthew 26, verse 28. But fruit of the vine. Now wine is fruit of the vine, but more than fruit of the vine. It's fruit of the vine that's gone through some chemical process of fermenting or has had alcoholic content added to it. But fruit of the vine is simply grape juice. And the Lord took a cup of that and gave it to the apostles and told them all to drink of it because it was representative of his blood of the New Testament which was shed for many for their mission of sins. So the elements of the Lord's Supper are identified clearly here. Unleavened bread and fruit of the vine or as we call it grape juice. There was a day assigned in the New Testament for the observance of this memorial. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, Luke tells us that Paul and a number of companions were in the city of Troas. The previous verses tell us that some of them had arrived a week earlier. And yet, Luke says, upon the first day of the week when the disciples were come together to break bread, and here is one of your passages where the breaking of bread is a figure of speech for both of the elements, the Lord's Supper. On the first day of the week when we were come together to break bread, Paul preached unto them or discoursed with them, intending to depart on the morrow, and he continued his speech until midnight. Now, some of them were there for a week before they got there on a Monday. And yet this breaking of bread is something that could not have been done on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday. Or they would have done it. Notice Paul was intending to depart on the morrow, which he did, as subsequent verses tell us. But if you look at... About verse 16, you'll see that Paul was in a hurry. He was hastening to get to Jerusalem by the Pentecost. Why in the world didn't they have this breaking of bread if it was just a fellowship meal, as some try to allege? On Monday, or at the latest Tuesday after Paul got there, he could have saved a week's travel time. Oh, this was a breaking of bread that could only be done on the first day of the week, you see. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul said, As I've given order unto the churches of Galatia, so give I unto you. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, Literally, it could be translated, cast into the treasury. As God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings or collections when I come. Well, that's talking about giving our money. That's not the Lord's Supper. Yes, I know that. But look at the implications concerning the Lord's Supper. He didn't command them to meet on the first day of the week. He had taught them that when he established the church record of which we have in Acts chapter 18. What were they doing, among other things, on the first day of the week when they met? Turn back to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians and begin with verse 17. And through the remainder of the chapter, you'll see that they were observing the Lord's Supper and Paul even quotes 
beginning in about verse 23, the very revelation that Christ had given him of the institution of the supper and the purpose of it. They were corrupting it, but they were observing it, apparently, on the right day. This is one of the things they were doing when they met on the first day of the week. Now you're also to give your money on the first day of the week, chapter 16. So the Lord's Supper, the observance of it is connected to a certain day, a day of the week, the first day of the week. To observe it on a Thursday night or a Saturday afternoon or a Monday morning, nothing immoral about that. But when we get to the judgment, the Lord's not going to judge our worship unto him by what's moral and immoral, but by what he has said in his word. So morally innocent is not good enough. Is it scripturally innocent and authorized? Or does the practice become guilty before the scriptural test? Well, let's look at one more of these illustrations. And that one I want us to look at in closing is an all-encompassing one. It's the entire denominational structure itself. It may be called the denominational industry because that is what it is. Denominationalism's uh, view of the church is that the church is this huge umbrella or dome. And all of the denominations with all of their names and all of their doctrines and their practices are under that one umbrella that make up the church. Is there anything immoral about that idea? No. But is it a scriptural concept of the church? What do the scriptures portray and depict as we read them about the church, the nature of it, and the purpose of it, and all of the things pertaining to it? Because... That's what all the New Testament really centers around. It is the church. What it is. How to get in it. The blessings therein. The hope of its members and so forth. Well, when we turn to the scriptures, we find <coughs> church first mentioned in the words of our Lord in Matthew chapter 16. I will build my church, he said in verse 18. And he said the foundation of it will be the fact that I'm the son of God. It's going to be built upon me. It will not be built upon one of the apostles, Simon Peter, any of the rest of them. It will not be built upon any conglomeration of men. It will be built upon me as the son of the living God. Well, we have to continue reading through the first four books of the New Testament and get into the fifth book before we learn of the building of that church or of its coming into existence. Acts chapter 2 gives us the record of the Holy Spirit's coming upon the apostles, enabling them to speak in languages they'd never studied and to preach for the first time salvation on the merits of the blood of Christ not on the blood of bulls and goats or any other measure. So he placed upon them the guilt of crucifying the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world. Their hands were dripping blood from it. And some of them cried out and said, what shall we do? They were told to repent and be baptized for forgiveness of their sins by the authority of Christ. And about 3,000 of them did so. And then we read this word church again in verse 47. The Lord added to the church or to them daily that were being saved. So the record of the existence of the church begins at this point. 
Every passage in the Bible, whether Old or New Testament, that speaks of the coming kingdom or of the church before Acts 2 in verse 47 is always anticipating its coming. Every passage after Acts 2 in verse 47 has men and women being added to the church, the kingdom, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the other figures that are used to describe it. And so there can be no doubt whatsoever as to the beginning point of the church that Jesus promised to build. Now what was the nature of that church? Did he want it to be a, a mass of people who could choose their own ways and their own doctrines and their own names and their own practices as part of his church? Well, that is the farthest thing from the picture that we see of the church in the New Testament. The Lord had warned about false prophets. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly ravening wolves, Matthew 7, verse 15. He had warned those of his day, Matthew 15, verses 6 and 8 and 9, the scribes and the Pharisees, religious leaders of their day, not to make void the word of God by your traditions. And he said, in vain you worship me teaching for your doctrines or as your doctrines the commandments of men. So even before the church came into existence, here are these warnings of principles that would have to do with the purity of his church when it was established. As we see the picture of the church being established and how people were added to it in those early days, we see it growing and multiplying and flourishing and then spreading to the four corners of the world as Jesus had said it was to do through the preaching of the gospel, the Great Commission. And then when we get past the book of Acts, which tells us of how the church began and grew, and we get into the epistles, we see conditions within the church, and we see causes of problems that arose. And they're rooted without exception in departures from the truth of God's word. Did the Lord want those who were his disciples to be many different bodies or one? He prayed, did he not, that they all be one, speaking of the apostles. So he didn't want Peter to have one church and Paul to have a different church, as some try to have them making. Peter had a Jewish church and Paul had a Gentile church. And he didn't want James and John's springing off into different branches with their own version of the church. The passage we looked at this morning in our Bible class, Ephesians chapter 4. Give diligence, Paul said, to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Remember there's one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Spirit. You keep all of these things as one. And the nearest thing we have to a picture of denominationalism in the New Testament, I suppose, is in the church in Corinth. And yet it's only an embryo here. If it were allowed to continue, it doubtless would have gone into a denominational sort of arrangement. So after his greetings of the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians, Paul immediately launches into a barrage of correction and condemnation for the division that had arisen. Verse 10, I beseech you therefore through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you, there be no divisions among you. What does that sound like? It sounds like denominationalism, doesn't it? That you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. That you all speak the same things. That doesn't sound like denominationalism to me. And then he describes 
Some of you are calling yourselves after my name, and some after the name of Apollos, another eloquent preacher. Some after the name of Cephas or the Apostle Peter. Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in Paul's name? Why are you doing this? Christ alone is who we must follow. And his doctrine and his way. And what did he write to the Galatian churches? Chapter 1, verse 6, beginning, I marvel, I'm amazed that you're so quickly removing from him who calls you in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ unto a different gospel, which is not another gospel, for there is one gospel. Then he went on to emphasize. And if any man or even an angel from heaven preaches unto you any other gospel than that which I preached unto you, he's accursed. So the Lord did not envision a denominational concept of his church, did he? Oh, no. He wanted his people to be one. And the only way they can be one is to take his word and abide within his word. Then shall they be one. Now the New Testament picture of the church is the church is those people who are in it because they have obeyed the gospel plan of salvation as set forth in Acts chapter 2 and illustrated and taught throughout the rest of the book of Acts and who are worshiping and serving the Lord according to the New Testament. That is the church and everything outside of that is denominationalism. Nominationalism is not under the church dome, not by New Testament definition. It is under the doctrines and creeds of men. Well, that was and is its origin. It matters not how many thousands of those groups there are claiming to be a part of the church. The New Testament teaches us otherwise. This principle could be illustrated in many, many other ways, as you know. That we must have more than a moral judgment about the things we do in worship and service unto God. They must pass the scriptural test. The authority of Christ test. For if what we do is not in the name of or by the authority of Christ, we're not only wasting our efforts, but we're opposing Christ. We're tearing down that which he came to build up and which he did build. We are anti-Christ. We're working against him. We have God and his son only if we abide in the doctrine of Christ. Second John, verses 9 and 10. So then, let us make all that we do in word or in deed, as Colossians 3.17 says, come under the gaze and the gauge of the authority of Christ. His authority is made known in only one way, and that's through his word. The entire plan of salvation is under attack by most religious groups today. They have no, uh, no concept of it and no willingness to abide within it. They have their own plans, faith only, or grace only, or universalism, everybody's going to be saved anyway, and other variations of it. But my friend, when we go back to just what the New Testament says, how people became Christians, how people had their sins forgiven, how people were added to the church, and all of those add up to the same thing, basically. We start at Acts chapter 2 when the church was established. We learn that those who heard the gospel on that day believed and desired to know what to do to be saved. And when they inquired, they were told by inspired men, 
not mere uninspired folks like us here today to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness and remission of their sins. When they did so, they were pronounced saved and added to the church in one fell swoop. Acts 2 and verse 47. And then they were to live in the way that the New Testament teaches us to live. To worship as the church in the way that the New Testament teaches and exemplifies that they worshiped. Let's get our song books out. Let's be ready to sing this good song in just a moment. As we do, we'll be thinking about those who might be someday watching this on our YouTube channel. Or someday pulling it up from the archives of our website. Or some even who might be live streaming it at this moment. I ask you to seriously consider what we've said. I do not believe that it can be refuted on the basis of Scripture. Now it can be argued against, but it cannot be successfully refuted because it simply is the truth. And so I appeal to you to open your heart to the truth and let it determine your convictions and your behavior. And let's go to heaven together. If anyone here needs to respond to the gospel invitation by letting us baptize you upon the confession of your faith in Christ and repentance of your sins, this very day, this hour, the baptistry is in there just waiting. Please let us help you with that. If you need to come back, having straight away, let us encourage you and help you with that. Let's stand together and sing.